Dead America, Idaho, Part 2. Dead America, The Second Month, Book 8. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter 1. Rebuild, Day 3. Captain Kersey sat by the front window of the farmhouse, keeping watch for threats. The sun began to creep above the horizon, illuminating the light snowfall that had been going for a couple of hours. A light dusting of white powder covered the entirety of the farmland, an almost peaceful sight despite the stressful times. He took a deep breath and then turned at the sound of footsteps as Betsy approached with two cups of coffee. Thought this might help, she said with a smile as she held out a steaming mug. Kersey gratefully took it, breathing in the earthy scent and letting out a happy sigh before taking a short, savoury first sip. Thank you, he said. It's freeze-dried instant stuff, so I know it's not ideal, she said with a light blush colouring her cheeks. But we haven't had power in weeks, so boiling water is about all I can do. He offered her a reassuring smile. It's perfect, really, he said. Reminds me of the stuff they'd pack into the MREs when we were out in the field. One of those acquired tastes, I suppose. Betsy sat down and took a sip from her own mug, wrinkling her nose a little at the taste. Kind of like the pizza you get in elementary school, she said. Overprocessed frozen crap made from the cheapest ingredients they could find. Yet, somehow, even a couple decades later, I still want a piece. Kersey chuckled, and they sat in a comfortable silence for a few moments, drinking and watching out the window. Finally, he cocked his head. So, if you don't mind me asking, he said slowly, what's the story with Joe and Robert? Pretty sure Robert came with the place, Betsy replied with a shrug. Not sure if it was his or not, but he was here when we got here. He welcomed us in, so we didn't question it. The captain nodded thoughtfully. And what about Joe? he asked. You seemed pretty close to him when we got back yesterday. It's nothing like that, she said quickly, shaking her head. It wasn't always just the three of us here. When this thing started, there were seven of us who found our way to the farm. I got into a wreck a few miles away. One of those things darted out from the woods and I lost control of the car. Joe and one of his friends picked me up and brought me here. I don't know if they knew the owners or just knew this place was here, but in the end I didn't really care. I was just happy to be safe. She clenched her jaw for a moment, taking a deep breath and then another sip of coffee, her mug quivering slightly. Kersey waited patiently, giving her time as she struggled with telling her story. Anyway, she finally said, letting out a deep whoosh of breath. Over the last few weeks, people have ventured out for one reason or another. Food, supplies, looking for a loved one. She blinked rapidly, swallowing hard. Joe coming back yesterday was the first time anybody has made it back alive. Guess I was just happy and got carried away. I'm kind of surprised Robert didn't give him a hug, if I'm being honest. Kersey offered a smile. Nothing wrong with getting carried away about people making it back alive, he assured her. Been far too little of that, Betsy said, her voice thick with emotion. Preaching to the choir on that one, the captain replied dryly, and shook his head. I've heard horror stories about the sacrifices that were made to secure the city. She shivered. We've struggled just to secure this little farmhouse, she said. I can't imagine what it would take to clear a city of that size. He took a long sip of coffee and gazed out the window, trying to gather himself before speaking. It's okay, Betsy said softly. You don't have to talk about it. She put a hand on his arm and gave it a reassuring squeeze. We can change the subject. The captain shook his head. It's okay, he said, returning her smile, though his didn't reach his sad eyes. I didn't have it anywhere near as hard as these guys, so I don't really have room to complain. What do you mean? Betsy asked. You weren't in the field with them? He shook his head, scrunching up his face with distaste. I was one of the essential people, he said, raising his hand to mimic air quotes. I was on the planning team and was in charge of making sure everybody on my front of the invasion was where they were supposed to be. 
I bet it was hard not to be in the fight with your friends, she said softly, curling both hands around her mug. It was, he replied thoughtfully. But that wasn't the hardest part. I was tied into all the communications. I lost count of the number of distress calls I heard. He paused for a beat. Young soldiers, never seen a day of combat in their lives, begging for help. Reporting casualties, saying they had to shoot their friend in the head because they were bitten. He swallowed hard. A solid week of nothing but that, it... wore on me, he admitted. Betsy curled her legs underneath her. Not cut out for that kind of work? she asked. Kersey couldn't help but chuckle. I mean, they claim I am, he said wistfully. But thankfully I'm a lot more comfortable out here in the field, drinking freeze-dried coffee and roughing it. She trilled out a laugh, and he glanced around the room at the pillows and blankets and wood stove keeping the room toasty. Well, relatively speaking, he said, cheeks pinking a bit at having insulted what they had. She laughed again, breaking the tension, and Kersey turned back to the window and froze. What is it? she asked, eyes going wide at his sudden shift in demeanor. About fifty yards out, he said quietly, pointing. Betsy leaned in, squinting. I don't see anything, she admitted. Look at the ground, he instructed. She adjusted her gaze and saw what he'd spotted. Two sets of footprints in the snow. He looked over them, stretching from the edge of the woods to an outbuilding about seventy yards from the trees. There's no way those slow-moving things made those without us noticing, Betsy said. My thoughts exactly, Kersey said, getting to his feet. Start getting the troops up. She nodded and set down her mug, moving to the other side of the room to gently wake the soldiers. Kersey turned and leaned over the couch, smacking Kowalski on the forehead. The sniper groaned. What the hell, Cap? he whined. It can't be my time for watch again already. We got trouble, Kersey replied. Kowalski rubbed his eyes. Zombies? he asked, voice still foggy with sleep. Nope, the captain said, popping the pee. Kowalski sighed and got to his feet, reaching down for his rifle he'd laid next to him. Where do you want me? he said, shaking the sleep from his head. Upstairs, facing front, Kersey instructed. Get Wade on your way up. Yep, Kowalski replied, running off and smacking Wade on the way by. As the second sniper got up, limbering up and grabbing his rifle, the captain raised a hand. Kowalski, he said. The sniper turned, looking a lot more bright-eyed this time. Yeah, Cap? he asked. Don't fire first, Kersey said. Kowalski's brow furrowed. What? he asked. You want me to wait until they shoot at us? The captain held up his gun. No, you can fire if I do, he instructed. There's a chance that they aren't hostiles. Really, Cap? Kowalski asked dryly. Kersey shrugged. Hey, it's happened before, he defended. The sniper shook his head, and he and Wade disappeared up the stairs. The rest of the men were up and armed, taking up positions around the windows and doors. Joe emerged from the bedroom with Robert close behind, rubbing sleep from his eyes. What's going on? Joe asked. Kersey inclined his head towards the window. Some people sneaking around outside, he said. We're just taking precautions. Where do you want me? Joe asked. The captain motioned for the room they'd come from. Take Betsy and Robert and hunker down in the back bedroom, he said. Bullshit, Robert said gruffly. We're capable of fighting. Kersey raised his hand, palm out. I know you are, he said, voice level as a diplomat. But we're more capable. Trust me, though, if we need you, I won't hesitate to ask. Robert paused, seeming to contemplate his response for a moment, before nodding in agreement. Betsy tugged on the older man's arm, and the three civilians headed into the back bedroom. Okay, people, what do you see? Kersey asked, turning back to the window. Whole lot of nothing, Cap, Moss reported. Dawson called. Nothing at the back door. I think I got something, Cap, Johnson called from the side of the house, aiming his gun at a window. Right side of the outbuilding there, coming off of the roof. The building had a slanted roof from front to back and on the right side snow vibrated off of the top in a rhythmic pattern, as if someone was climbing on the other side. Kersey moved to the foot of the stairs and whistled. 
A moment later, Kowalski popped his head out. Yeah, Cap? he asked. Got a climber on the outbuilding to the side of the house, Kersey replied. Shooter getting in place? the sniper asked. Kersey nodded. That's my guess, he said. Do I still have to wait before shooting? Kowalski asked. The captain shook his head. If he aims a gun in this direction, take his head off, he said. Yes, sir, Kowalski replied happily. Sir, we have movement by the woods, Copeland called from the front of the house. Kersey joined him, looking out at the road which had some light tree coverage on either side of the driveway. There was movement in the shadows, to be sure, and he sighed. Looks like quite the party, the captain murmured. Copeland nodded. I saw a dozen, give or take, he said. So that's fourteen we know about, Kersey replied. This is going to get ugly if we're not careful. I'm not above dishing out some wholesale slaughter, the sergeant said. Kersey tongued his cheek for a moment, contemplating. He wasn't thrilled with the prospect, but ultimately realized it was their only option at this point, and nodded in agreement. If they're throwing this many men at us, it's clear they see us as a threat, he replied. We're going to be vulnerable on the road, so if we send them a message, they might back off, Copeland finished, nodding, at least long enough for us to get where we're going. What do you need? Kersey asked. Copeland pointed up. Get way to the front of the house, give him a green light, he said. Gut shots, not head shots. Make them think we have a sadistic streak in us. Kersey shook his head. Remember the good old days when the enemy feared us because they knew who we were? He asked dryly. No, oh, don't worry, Cap, Copeland replied with a wink. In about twenty minutes, those days will be back again. Kersey chuckled and patted the sergeant on the back before walking to the stairs. He ran up them, looking at Wade, who was with Kowalski at the side of the house. Wade, he said, waving the sniper over. Sir, Wade replied immediately. Kersey motioned to the front. Front of the house, dozen hostiles, who look to do us harm, he said. On it, sir, Wade replied. Gut shots, Kersey added. The sniper paused for a moment, looking to the captain with a questioning gaze, receiving a subtle nod in return. Not a fan of sending a message, Wade admitted with a sigh, especially since there aren't any hospitals anymore. I understand, Kersey replied, but we need them to be scared so they back off unless you want to fight them on the road. The sniper swallowed hard and then let out a deeper sigh before nodding. I'll do what needs to be done, sir, he promised. Thank you, the captain said, and as he moved down the stairs, a gunshot cracked. Holy hell! That dude's head just exploded, Johnson bellowed. Kersey ran to the window, looking at the outbuilding. There was a slumped body and crimson snow on the roof. Get ready, the captain declared and the troops got into battle positions. Within seconds, the bullets ripped through the little farmhouse. Everybody hit the deck, allowing for the initial barrage from the front to subside. As soon as the torrent of shots began to die down, Copeland popped up and opened fire. Kersey slid along the floor to the other window and took up position, looking out at nearly twenty men emerging from the trees about fifty yards away. They ran and fired erratically with only very few looking like they were at all trained in combat. Kersey aimed at one of the more trained-looking men, assuming ex-military, but before he could pull the trigger, the man's gut exploded in a splash of red. He fell to the ground, gripping his belly tightly, and the man next to him looked on with wide eyes, terrified. The captain didn't waste time adjusting his aim and firing at the scared man. His bullet punched through his chest, a little higher than what he'd been aiming for, the man fell to the ground, blood splattering everywhere. The rest continued to approach the house, several diving down and lying prone while firing. Kersey and Copeland had trouble getting clean shots on them as a result, so they turned their attention to the one still standing. Bullets continued to rip through the front of the house, shattering the glass above the soldiers. Kersey looked to his left at the advancing men that stayed in their lanes, not even trying to get to the other side of the house. He knew an opportunity when he saw it, and he glanced over his shoulder at the men on the side of the house, only firing a couple of shots. Johnson, get over here, he barked. The soldier crawled along the floor, staying out of the bullet path and crouching next to him. Take my position, Kersey instructed. Johnson nodded. Where are you going? he asked. Gonna flank the fuckers, the captain replied, and left the window, staying low. 
He worked his way to the side of the house, opposite the outbuildings, and stepped up next to Baker and Bretts, who were aiming out but not firing. Quiet over here, boys? the captain asked. Bretts nodded. Got nothing but open field over here, he replied, so I'm not surprising they aren't coming this way. Good, Kersey said. We're going to use it. Corporal, you're with me. Baker, be ready to cover us if we come running. Yes, sir, Baker replied with a firm nod. Kersey and Bretts hopped out the window, keeping their guns aimed towards the front of the house. They were far enough back on the structure that nobody currently firing at them could spot them easily. The captain scanned the area, spotting a pile of wood about thirty yards away, diagonal from them towards the front of the house. We're going to run like hell to the wood, he said quietly. Should give us an angle on them. Bretts nodded and crouched, getting ready for Kersey to make his move. Go, the captain hissed and they both took off running, expecting to be shot at, but relieved when they weren't. When they reached the woodpile, Kersey peeked out to the battlefield. He saw half a dozen men laying on the ground, a couple dead, four holding their bellies and writhing around in pain. He spotted a trio of men taking shelter behind Joe's truck. They took turns popping up from behind cover and taking a few shots before ducking back down. Nobody from the house fired at them, not wanting to damage their way out. Three by the truck. Let's take them down, Kersey said softly. Bretts nodded, and they broke from cover, the corporal a few steps behind and to the side. They were within fifteen yards before anyone noticed, but before they knew what hit them, a spray of gunfire dropped the three. Despite the gut-shot order, Kersey and Bretts quickly executed the men with headshots as the gun battle continued to escalate. They watched as a couple more men dropped, one in the gut and another with a skull shot that blew his head open in a spectacular fashion. Immediately after that, a chorus of Retreat! erupted from the still-standing men. Kersey counted about eight of them, firing wildly as they ran back, peeling themselves from the ground and running. One unlucky man happened to be close enough to the truck, firing back over his shoulder as Kersey popped out and grabbed the rifle before firing into his gut. The man screamed in pain and hit the ground, looking on helplessly as his men abandoned him. Bretts put a boot on the man's gun hand as both he and Kersey aimed at the fallen man. "'Good morning, sunshine,' Kersey said brightly. "'Any chance you want to explain to me why you decided to interrupt our breakfast?' "'Ah!' the man hissed, puffing out his cheeks as he attempted to breathe through his pain. "'I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I bet you are.' Kersey replied, cocking his head. But you didn't answer my question. Please, please, the man moaned. I'm shot. I need help. You keep giving me information I already have, the captain said, clucking his tongue. I know you're shot. I'm the one who shot you. Please, I need something for the pain, the man begged, writhing. Kersey sighed. Okay, I'll get you something for the pain, he said. Corporal? Bretts raised an eyebrow. Yes, sir, he asked. Please go inside and see if they have any lemon juice in the kitchen, Kersey instructed. The corporal played along with his bluff, putting a finger to his chin. If memory serves, sir, they were out last night, he replied. I looked when we were having tea. Pity, the captain said, shaking his head. I did see a big container of salt, though, Bretts added with a smirk. Kersey nodded. Yeah, that'll work he said. Wait, wait, the man begged, his eyes wide with saucers. Please, no. The captain raised an eyebrow. Go on, he prompted. It, it was Conrad, the man hissed. He said you were a threat and needed to be eliminated. Did you believe him? Kersey asked. The man let out a gasping sob. I do now, he moaned. Please. Yeah, yeah, you're in pain, the captain said flippantly, waving him off. Is Conrad with you? he asked. No, no, the man replied raggedly. He just ordered us to take you out. Are there more men? Kersey asked. I, I don't know, he groaned. They only tell me where to go. The captain leaned over, staring him dead in the eyes. Well, you're going to deliver a message for me. He waited for the man to nod and then continued. You tell Conrad that this is just a taste of what we are capable of. If he's smart, he'll leave us be. Can you do that? Yes, please, 
the man begged. I need something for the pain. Kersey straightened, reaching into his pocket and pulling out a small single-serve packet of ibuprofen and tossing it onto the man's chest. If you can't swallow without water, you can chew them up, he said. It'll taste like shit, but it'll help a bit with the pain. The wounded man groaned, looking around in bewilderment as the two men walked back towards the house. When they were out of earshot, Bretz asked quietly, Do you believe him? I don't know, maybe, Kersey replied. All I know is we can't stay here. We need to get moving. Now. Chapter 2 Kersey and Brett stood guard by the back of the truck with their guns trained on the road. The others rushed from the house, carrying what they needed, moving around the bodies littering the yard. The wounded man that Kersey had shot was still beside the truck as Johnson came running up, tossing his bag into the back of the vehicle and nearly tripping on the guy. "'Hey, Cap, can I do something about him?' he drawled. Brett shook his head. "'We need them wounded, remember?' he asked. "'Well, hell, Corporal, I wasn't going to execute him,' Johnson replied. "'Just drag him off a bit so he don't trip us up.' The duo exchanged a quick glance and a shrug. "'Have at it,' Bretts finally agreed. Johnson reached down and grabbed the guy by his collar. He didn't wait for the man to brace himself, just started pulling. The guy screamed in pain as the soldier dragged him across the ground about ten yards away, dropping him back like a sack of potatoes. "'There you go, Bubba.' Johnson said, swiping his palms together and heading back to the truck while everyone piled into the back. The front cab wasn't very big, so the three civilians and Moss got in, with the latter by the window, gun at the ready. "'Sure you wouldn't be more comfortable in the back?' Joe asked, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. Moss shook his head. "'We need a gunner by the window,' he said, motioning to his rifle. "'In fact, you're going to have to get in the back. Pretty sure the captain is going to be driving.' Joe blinked at him, but didn't move. "'Or you can sit on my lap if you'd like,' Moss continued, and that seemed to snap the man out of his reverie. "'Okay, back of the truck it is,' he said, and clambered into the back. Robert moved into the middle, and Kersey piled in behind the wheel. He glanced back, making sure the men had positioned themselves in attack mode, though packed in tight like sardines. "'Try and go easy over those bumps, Cap.' Kowalski said through the back window. Gonna be rough ride back here. No promises, Kersey called back and fired up the vehicle. He took off, ripping around the yard, trying to avoid the bodies and keep everyone in the truck bed. When he pulled up to the road, he paused and looked to Robert. So, where am I going? he asked. Kuna is to the southeast, Robert replied, motioning vaguely with his hand. Turn left, drive for three miles, then hang a left and straight on until we hit it. Sounds easy enough, Moss said. Kersey sighed. It always sounds easy enough, he said dryly. Moss chuckled, shrugging in agreement. The captain drove out onto the road and sped up, quickly hitting fifty miles per hour. The snow flurries had calmed down a bit, but the road was still a bit slack. It wasn't too far down the road before two vehicles peeled out onto the road in the distance behind them, headed their way. Kowalski, Copeland barked. Let the captain know we got trouble. The sniper threw open the sliding window as he surveyed the situation. Contact, six o'clock, he cried. Two vehicles, closing fast. Make sure you greet them properly, Kersey called back. Kowalski turned to Copeland and the others, raising a fist. Light the fuckers up, he bellowed. The trio at the back readied their weapons as the trucks gained ground, and within moments they were within a hundred yards. Wait until you can see the drivers, the sergeant instructed. The other soldiers waited patiently for the trucks to get within firing range. The enemy wasn't as patient, and two gunmen stood up in the backs and began to fire towards them. The soldiers in the truck ducked down slightly, but didn't get too worked up, knowing that at that distance the amateur gunmen were unlikely to hit their target. The trucks continued to speed towards them, and then finally Copeland could see the driver. He took careful aim and squeezed the trigger, sending a round right through the windshield. He wasn't sure if it struck the driver, but the reaction to the glass shattering caused the man to swerve violently. The tires skidded on the wet snow covering the pavement, but unfortunately managed to get control of the vehicle again, despite sending one of the gunmen flying from the back. 
The man flew through the air, landing on a barbed wire cattle fence. It wasn't a kill shot, but it was one less person shooting at them, which was all Copeland cared about. The other ones sped up their firing rate, with some bullets hitting the back of their vehicle. Let him have it, the sergeant bellowed, and the three soldiers opened fire, sending a torrent of lead back down the road. The enemy trucks took heavy damage, with the engines beginning to smoke and the windshields quickly becoming cracked. One truck quickly lost steam, rapidly decelerating, while the other began to swerve violently from side to side. Copeland got a brief view of the cab, seeing the passenger reaching over for the wheel. A few seconds later, the truck careened off the road, going into a ditch and flying airborne out the other side. It landed several yards in the field, nose first, flinging the gunman in the back twenty yards into the frozen air. "'Everybody good?' Copeland asked, looking around as the men breathed a sigh of relief and gave him a thumbs up in response. The truck came to a quick stop, sliding along the slick road. Shit, that can't be good, the sergeant muttered, and looked through the truck cab, peering between the narrow lane between the soldiers in the back and the people sitting inside. There was a blockade of three trucks in the intersection, completely closing off the road about fifty yards away. Nobody fired from the blockade, however. He could easily see a dozen men that had taken up defensive positions behind them. Kersey gripped the steering wheel tightly, trying to plot his move. "'Is this the turn we need?' he asked. Robert nodded. "'It's close enough,' he said. Kersey looked to his left at the intersection, seeing that the ditch wasn't too deep. It would be bumpy, but survivable. The road beside them had metal fencing which they wouldn't be able to get through for sure. He reached up and knocked on the back window. Kowalski, he said. The sniper ducked his head down. Who do you want me to kill, Cap? he asked. Kersey shook his head. I need you and Wade to take out their tires, he instructed. Vehicles on the edge. Should be enough to block in that center one long enough for us to get away. We can do that, the sniper replied slowly, clearly crestfallen. But can I at least shoot someone as we drive by? Kersey shrugged. Knock yourself out, he said. Give a tap on the window when you two are ready, and let the guys know to hold on, because it looks like it's going to get rough. Kowalski nodded and turned to the rest of the soldiers as Kersey gripped the steering wheel, staring ahead and focusing himself. Moss, when we get rolling, I want you to lay down suppressing fire, he said. We're going to have to get way too close to them for comfort in order to make that turn. Moss nodded sharply. You got it, Cap, he said. Kowalski tapped on the back window, and Kersey glanced at the civilians. Duck down as low as you can, he instructed, and then specifically to Robert, and be ready to grab this wheel. He nodded. I'll be ready, he promised. Kowalski and Wade knelt down behind the cab of the truck, rifles in hand and ready to strike. I'll take right, you take left, Kowalski said. Wade nodded firmly. Just don't miss, he replied. Reading my mind, his companion drawled. I was just about to say the same thing to you. Wade smirked, and they both silently counted down in unison. Both snipers popped up at the same time, taking quick aim at the tires on the outer vehicles and squeezing their triggers. The tires on the trucks exploded, and in response the gunmen all opened fire, most of the shots missing but a few peppering the front grille of the truck. Kersey punched the gas, quickly gaining speed and the snipers toppled backwards, their brethren catching them in the truck bed. Moss stuck his rifle out the window and fired in three-round bursts as quickly as he could pull the trigger. Bullets sprayed the blockade, forcing a few of the gunmen back behind cover. When they were within ten yards of the intersection, bullets found their targets a little more, with the windshield taking several shots. A few narrowly missed Kersey's head, and he ducked down as low as he could while still being able to see the road. "'Hang on!' he yelled and jerked the wheel to the left, sending the truck careening into the ditch. The vehicle flew several feet in the air and landed hard on the road. The soldiers in the back rose up out of their seated positions, hanging on to the side railing and each other to keep them as weighed down as possible. As soon as they were settled, they sent a few rounds back towards the barricade, keeping the gunmen at bay, so they couldn't move the disabled vehicles to get the last remaining one in pursuit. About a mile up the road, Copeland finally relaxed his shoulders from his tense firing position. I think we're good, he said, looking around. Everybody okay? 
There was a smattering of affirmative noises as the soldiers inspected themselves for damage. Kowalski ducked down and looked in the cab, eyes widening when he noticed the front windshield was splinterwebbed with bullet holes. Jesus Christ, is everybody okay up there? he cried. Kersey kept an eye on the road as he quickly glanced at everyone in the cab. Amazingly enough, I think we are, he said. Just a little pissed off, Robert added gruffly, but otherwise good. What happened, Kowalski? Moss called back in a teasing voice. I thought you were going to wipe them out as we went by. Well, I was planning on it until the captain here decided to pull an evil Knievel and try to jump the goddamn Grand Canyon, the sniper retorted. Kersey rolled his eyes. We didn't get that high off of the ground, he drawled. Says the man who is firmly secured inside the cab with a seatbelt, Kowalski shot back. Laughter erupted throughout the groups, inside and out, everyone finally relieving the tension with a bit of levity having survived another encounter with the Chosen. So how much farther is this place? Kersey asked. Robert motioned with his hand. Just stay straight for about fifteen miles, he said. Won't be able to miss it. Kowalski, make sure everybody back there stays frosty, the captain instructed. If there are more patrols, I don't want them to get the jump on us. The sniper nodded and turned to deliver the instructions, while Kersey stayed focused on the hopefully easier road ahead. Chapter 3 When the truck grew close to the city limits, Kersey slowed down, looking for signs of life. They crept along the road, hundreds of corpses lined up along the side of it. Bodies were strewn everywhere, heads blown clean off. If we're not in the right place, we're damn close, Moss murmured. Hang a ride at this next intersection, Robert instructed. It should take us to downtown. Kersey complied, making his turn but keeping it slow. His soldiers kept their guns at the ready, and he reached back and knocked on the window to get Kowalski's attention. Nobody fires unless I give the signal, the captain called. Kowalski cocked his head. Even if they shoot first? he asked. Even if they shoot first, Kersey confirmed with a nod. We need allies out here, and if they've been facing what we just faced, they may assume we're the enemy. The sniper nodded. Understood, Cap, he said, and then turned to relay the message. Kersey kept rolling right up the road, spotting a massive barricade about five blocks up. The entire road was walled off with rigid metal fencing about eight feet high. There didn't appear to be any guards. However, there were a couple dozen bodies laying in the road. Looks like our place, Kersey said, and glanced at Robert. Maybe if we go up and honk the horn? The older man shrugged. I've heard worse plans, he replied. The captain continued the slow drive up the road, and at about a block away, he hovered his hand over the horn. Before he could push it, however, a shot rang out, a bullet punching into the road right in front of them. A moment later, three gunmen appeared at the top of the wall, all aiming their weapons at the truck. Kowalski, introduce us, Kersey called through the back window. The sniper took a deep breath and stood up slowly with his empty hands raised high above his head. Um, hey there, he greeted. First off, I want to thank you for not shooting me as soon as I stood up. That is appreciated. He flashed them a wide smile. My name is Private Kowalski, and my friends and I are from the U.S. military. I can assure you we are not with those chosen assholes. Oh, yeah, one of the guards demanded. How do we know that? Well, for starters, as you can plainly see, my head is not firmly planted up my own ass, Kowalski drawled, and Kersey rolled his eyes. So right off the bat, you can tell I'm smart enough not to give myself a pretentious moniker, like The Chosen. The guard cracked a slight smile, but it disappeared quickly. Okay, so if you're not a part of The Chosen, then how did you find us? He demanded. The sniper looked down at Joe, motioning for him to get up. The civilian stood up as slowly as he could and removed his hat. Sir, my name is Joe, he said. I used to live by the Mountain Home Air Force Base. Over the last few weeks, my friends and I have been holed up in a farmhouse about twenty miles to the west of here. We've had a few survivors pass through, telling us stories about this place. 
The guard narrowed his eyes. If that's the case, then why did you wait until now to come pay us a visit? He asked. Joe shook his head. Because Ted Harris and his minions have been patrolling the roads, he said. If it wasn't for these soldiers, he wouldn't have made it here. The guard contemplated for a moment and pulled over one of his comrades. They chatted quietly, and then one of them talked into his walkie-talkie before finally turning back to the group. Okay, the guard called, raising a hand. We're going to let you in, but there are rules. Kowalski nodded. Always are, he said brightly. The guard pointed to the left. The entrance is three blocks that way, he said. Just go down this road, and we'll wave you in. You leave your truck outside the perimeter, and you leave all your weapons inside the truck. You just want us to abandon our gear and transportation? The sniper asked, wrinkling his nose. Don't worry, we'll have someone bring it inside, the guard assured him. And if you are who you say you are, you'll get it back soon enough, agreed? Kowalski looked down, and Kersey stuck his hand out the back window, giving him a thumbs up. Okay, agreed, he said. We'll see you inside then, the guard said. Kersey made the turn and drove slowly down the front wall of the community. Every single street was completely blocked off with metal walls. The buildings boarded up and reinforced with anti-personnel devices like spikes on the walls. Many had zombie corpses skewered in them. The front gate was a huge metal door on rollers. It was on the main street, which stretched on for several blocks away from camp, with a few buildings lining the road before backing off into fields. Several corpses lined the sidewalks, like they'd been shot and moved out of the way. Kersey pulled up to a stop and put the truck into park. Okay, everybody out, leave your weapons in the bed, he instructed. Hands up and move slowly. There was a chorus of, yes sir, and the soldiers fell into line the civilians at the front of the pack, next to the captain. He led them up to the door, which slowly opened from the center, wide enough for a few guards to come out with guns aimed at them. Everyone spread out so that the guards could inspect them all. A few of the guards went to the truck and peered down at the weapons inside. We're going to pat you down, if that's okay, one of the guards said. Kowalski grinned. Just don't linger too long, or I'll insist you buy me dinner first he drawled. The guard chuckled and moved down the line, giving everyone a pat down. After a few moments, the guards convened at the door again, and one of them waved them in. Come on in, he said. I'll take you to Ivan. The group followed him inside, entering the town. It was amazing inside, a snow-covered oasis in the middle of the apocalypse. There were dozens of people going about their lives, a pack of children playing in a nearby park, Guards posted in various positions like sentinels. Please follow me, sir, the guard from the wall they'd spoken with originally approached, and motioned to the group. He led them through town, revealing dozens more people just existing like nothing was going on outside the walls. Food appeared to be plentiful, small greenhouse gardens dotting the area, everyone dressed in warm winter clothing. The guard led them to a courthouse at the center of town, walking up to the door where a couple more guards let them inside. Inside, the main courtroom had been cleared of most tables and chairs, set up as what looked like a command center. Ivan, I have our new arrivals, the guard announced, and a dark-skinned woman that looked to be in her fifties stood up from her desk at the far end of the room. She got up, strode forward, her eyes friendly but her demeanor strong, and gave them a once-over. Our civilian friends look like they could use some coffee and breakfast, she said to the guard. Why don't you go arrange that for them? I'd like to have a nice little chat with our military friends here. Yes, ma'am, the guard replied. Kersey glanced at Robert, Joe, and Betsy, giving them a nod to let them know it was okay for them to go. Yvonne put a hand on her hip and leaned the other on her desk, waiting until the others were gone and the door closed before addressing the soldiers. Well, it only took a month for you to show back up after abandoning us in our time of need, she said dryly. It can only mean one or two things. Either you boys are really, really lost, or you think there's something this town has that you can take. 
You are correct, ma'am, Kersey replied politely. She nodded. If I had to venture a guess, I'd say you boys are running low on bullets, she said. Can't imagine invading Seattle was kind to your supplies. The captain raised an eyebrow. News spreads quickly, I see, he said. Honey, if you live in an isolated place like we do, you make real quick friends with a ham radio, she said, drumming her fingernails on the desk. We've talked to a few people in the area, and while we don't have the full story, we know enough to put two and two together. Kersey lifted a hand, palm out. Not that I was planning on underestimating you, he assured her, but I'm certainly not going to from here on out. She cracked a small smile. That's good to know, she quipped. What's your name, honey? I'm Captain Kersey, ma'am, he replied. But you can just call me Kersey. Yvonne wagged a finger at him. Oh, no, I'm going to call you Captain Kersey, she said firmly. It's a sign of respect. You earned that title, and by God, I'm going to abide by it. And in that same mindset, you may call me Queen Yvonne Ashley of Kuna. There was a brief, stunned silence at the woman's deadpan declaration, and after a beat, Yvonne doubled over into laughter and smacked him on the shoulder. The expression on your face is quite possibly my most favorite thing I have ever seen. She gasped through her mirth. You can just call me Yvonne, Captain Kersey. She wiped at her eyes, still giggling, and the soldiers shared bewildered chuckles. Thank you, Kersey said. She finally composed herself and took a deep breath. So, what do you want to know, Captain? She asked, leaning on her desk more casually, motioning to herself up and down. I'm an open book. How big is your camp here? He asked. She tilted her head back and forth. We've been too busy to do an official headcount, she said slowly. But we're somewhere around a thousand people. Kowalski let out a low whistle, impressed. She nodded at him, eyebrows raised. You damn right, honey, she drawled. It's been like herding cats to get everyone to work together. Granted, it became a little easier once we started having run-ins with the Chosen. They been causing you trouble? Kersey asked. She sighed. At first it was just some skirmishes where my people were making supply runs, she said. Then they decided to get bold and hit us here. You know all those bodies in the streets you passed while coming into town? The captain cocked a brow. Yeah? he asked. Only about half of them were zombies, Yvonne replied, shaking her head. My people don't miss around, especially when it comes to our safety. Kersey pursed his lips. So why did they want to hit this place so hard? he asked. Well, she trailed off with a ghost of a smirk, dragging out the word. We may have cleaned out a super center distribution warehouse. Got enough food to last us months, more than enough time to get our own food growing. Kersey nodded slowly, impressed. Sounds like you have everything under control, he said. She wagged a finger at him again. Not everything, Captain, she said loudly. Not everything. Which is why you and I are about to negotiate a little trade. Quid pro quo, if you will. He inclined his head to her. I'm listening, he said. You need ammunition, Yvonne continued motioning to them. My people have stockpiled quite the collection over the last few weeks, so we're more than happy to share what we have with you. Kersey shook his head. It's not just ammunition we need, he said. Go on, she invited, crossing her arms. We're looking to restart the factories, he explained. We have reinforcements coming in a week or so. Not just soldiers, but people who know how to work with those machines. We're playing the long game here. Yvonne nodded thoughtfully. Okay, I'll add that to our deal, she said, holding up a hand. We'll give you ammunition in the short term, and take you where you need to go so your people can start getting civilization back on track. And as a free sweetener. Some of my people here in town used to work at those factories. I'll make them available to your people when the time comes. He smiled. I appreciate it, he said, and then raised his chin. Now what is it that we can do for you? he asked. She took a deep breath and then pushed away from her desk to stand tall in front of the soldiers. A few days ago, we had a small team go into downtown Boise, she explained. We got a radio call from a couple of survivors, begging us to come get them. I sent four of my best men to go get them, but they became trapped in an office building, she sighed. 
We were preparing another team when the Chosen upped their patrols, forcing us to retreat. I was going to make another desperate push into town to get them, but since you're here— You'd like us to go rescue your people? Kersey finished. She grinned widely at him. If it's not too much of an inconvenience, she said sweetly. The captain chuckled. I think we can arrange that, ma'am, he said. Oh, and cut it out with that ma'am stuff, Yvonne drawled with a flippant wave of her hand. Every time one of you youngsters calls me that, it makes me feel old. Yvonne is just fine, honey. He laughed again. You got it, he said. Before the soldiers could move out, a torrent of gunfire erupted from outside, and they all stiffened. Yvonne raised a hand to calm them down. Everyone chill out, she said loudly. We put a whooping on the Chosen, so they aren't going to be stupid enough to try another raid this quick. She grabbed a walkie-talkie from her desk. But if it'll put your mind at ease, she clicked the button on the side of the device. Status report. Hundred, hundred and fifty ghouls on the eastern wall. A male voice came back through. Hold your fire, she instructed. Yvonne? he asked, confused. You heard me, she said with a smirk. Just going to be a couple minute break. I want to show you boys off to our new friends. Holding fire, came the reply. Yvonne lowered the radio and motioned for the soldiers to follow her. Come on, let me show you something, she said. They walked out of the building and followed her over to the eastern wall. As they approached, they spotted eight-foot-high walls with a system of ramps leading up to stations every ten feet or so. There were four people, three men and a woman, standing at the top, with a runner just below them and another sitting at the bottom of the ramp. Both the runner and the sitter each held a rifle. Yvonne motioned for the troops to follow her over to a ramp to the side. They walked up it, with everyone reaching the top able to peek over the side. They looked out over a field littered with bodies and still shambling corpses. All right, Yvonne said loudly. Show them how we handle ourselves. The four people resumed firing, carefully picking their targets. It was a systematic slaughter, with heads exploding every second. When one of them ran out of ammunition, they handed the gun to a runner, who handed them back a freshly loaded rifle. The runner darted to the bottom of the ramp, handing off the empty gun and grabbing the loaded one before going back up. The person at the bottom quickly reloaded and waited for the next cycle. The soldiers watched for several minutes as the four civilians laid waste to the zombie threat. Finally, the guns fell silent, and the soldiers stepped back from the wall, impressed. Kowalski began to clap, letting out a whoop, and two of the civilians gave a playful bow. Thank you! We're here all week! one of them bellowed. Kowalski grinned and pointed to him. I like that guy, he declared. Most of his companions rolled their eyes as they moved back down the ramp. What do you think, Captain? Yvonne asked as they reached the ground. He nodded and smiled. I think you have this town whipped into shape, he said. I'd do my best, she replied with a wink, and then raised the walkie-talkie to her lips again. Zeke, can you meet us by the eastern armory? she asked into the device. On my way, a man, presumably Zeke, replied. Come on, let's get you geared up, she said. Kersey raised a hand. We are pretty well supplied, he said. Trust me, you can always be better supplied, she quipped. Kersey and Brett shared a glance, and the corporal shrugged as they followed her a few blocks over to a storage building. A man in his mid-twenties stood there next to the open front door and grinned as they approached. "'Welcome to the candy store, gentlemen,' he drawled, stepping aside so Yvonne could lead them in. The room was wall-to-wall -wall guns, ammunition, and other goodies. Hunting rifles, assault rifles, even a couple of heavy-duty machine guns. There were several wooden crates filled with makeshift explosives, such as pipe bombs. Kersey turned around in a slow circle. "'This... This is impressive, Yvonne, he said as he took in the stash. They had all these at the ammunition factories, did they? Well, she dragged out the word, blinking at him with feigned innocence. We may have sent a few people to the abandoned Air Force base. Seems they were in such a hurry to leave that they didn't pack everything up. The captain blinked at a fifty cal machine gun on a shelf. I can see that, he said, raising an eyebrow. 
Don't think we'll need this kind of firepower for this particular mission, but good to know it's here. Well, you take whatever you think you'll need for the mission, she said, waving a flippant hand. We got enough for everybody. Brett's cocked his head. What kind of resistance are we looking at? he asked. Zeke, you talk to them last. Yvonne turned to the man who'd let them in, and he nodded. They're in a three-story building near downtown, he explained. At a minimum, the bottom floor is completely infested, most likely the second floor as well. Place is run down and was slated for demolition, but the apocalypse put that on hold. Kersey crossed his arms. Chosen? he asked. Zeke nodded again. Most likely in the area, he replied. They had to black out the windows because someone kept taking pot shots at them. How many ghouls? Bretz asked. A few hundred in and around the building, Zeke said. But it could easily be thousands if the noise ramps up. A lot of those things have wandered out of downtown, but a lot stayed behind. The corporal nodded thoughtfully. Nothing the nine of us can't handle, he said. Nothing four of us can't handle, Kersey corrected. Bretz and Yvonne eyed him in confusion. Captain, don't go shortchanging me now, she said, drumming her fingernails on a nearby shelf. I need my people back. He raised a hand, palm out. And we'll get them, he assured her. But since we riled up the Chosen to get here, I want to leave some of my men behind to help you out in case they come looking for us. Did you not see the display we put on for you? Yvonne asked, waving a hand around her head. We're prepared for them. He nodded, offering a placating smile. I did, he replied. But to paraphrase what you said, you can always be better prepared. With what we have in this room, we can fortify this place so that nothing will get in. And if you clear this place out, we have two other rooms that look about like this, Zeke added. Kersey gaped at Yvonne, and she smirked and shrugged. Your air force left behind a lot of stuff, she said sheepishly. The captain chuckled, shaking his head and turning to his men. Kowalski, Moss, Baker, you're going to be with me, he said. The rest of you coordinate with Ivan and get this place ready to push off a full-scale assault. There was a chorus of, yes, sir, as the soldiers stocked up on supplies. Kowalski pocketed a few pipe bombs, and Baker furrowed his brow. You're a sniper, he said, giving his arm a playful shove. What the hell are you going to do with those? Kowalski shrugged. Same thing anybody would, he quipped. Blow shit up. Captain, I'd like Zeke to tag along with you, Yvonne said, and Kersey shook his head. That's not necessary, he insisted. Zeke raised his chin. I've lived in Boise my whole life, right downtown, he said. I know the area like the back of my hand. Hiding spots, escape routes, you name it. And if you're worried about whether or not I can handle myself well, Zeke here is one of our top scouts. Yvonne cut in. Goes out on his own, scopes out what we need, and always comes back in one piece. The boy can handle himself. Kersey sized him up, and then approached him, his voice deadly level. Just so we're clear. If you come with us, then you're officially drafted into the military. He pointed a finger in the young man's face. Which means you do what I say when I say it, understood? Zeke nodded firmly. Yes, sir, he said. Good. Get geared up, Kersey replied, satisfied, as he stepped back from him. We're leaving in five. Chapter Four Kersey drove an SUV towards downtown Boise, carting the five of them towards their goal. He pulled into a small business parking lot about a half mile from where the buildings began getting dense. There were a handful of zombies in the lot, with about a dozen spread out over the block. Baker, Moss, clear them out, he instructed. The soldiers responded in the affirmative, pulling out their knives and casually walking over to the lumbering creatures. The corpses were spread out by several yards, and Baker and Moss made it look like dispatching them was more like busy work than an actual threat. As they went about their business, the others got out of the vehicle and congregated by the hood. Okay, Zeke, time to earn your keep, Kersey said. Where are we going? He inclined his head. Our team is trapped about a mile up this road, he replied. Straight shot? the captain asked. Zeke nodded. Straight shot? he confirmed. Corner of Fourth and Elm. From this position, it will be across Fourth on the left. I'm guessing a frontal assault isn't wise, Kersey mused. 
So what do you recommend? There is an indoor shopping area on the block between 3rd and 4th, two stories tall, Zeke replied. That should give us some cover on approach. Kowalski rolled his eyes. Going to the mall during a zombie apocalypse, because that always works out well, he drawled. In this case, it might be, Zeke said, because it was locked up tight when the outbreak began. Been in there a few times getting supplies from the hardware store, and once we're inside, it's smooth sailing. The sniper clucked his tongue. Famous last words, he said. How do we get in? Kersey asked. There is a maintenance entrance on the third street side, far end from us, Zeke explained. I rigged the door with a simple bolt latch for easy access. Once inside, there is a huge window overlooking 4th Street and our target. Any communication with your people? The captain asked. Zeke shook his head. No, and unlikely too, he said, holding up his old walkie-talkie. The charge on these things leaves a lot to be desired. Okay, let's get moving, Kersey said with a nod, and approached Baker and Moss as they finished their cleanup. There were a dozen or so zombies shambling towards them from across the street, but they were moving slowly. We're on the move, Kersey said, and both men wiped the blood from their knives before sheathing them. The group moved up the road with purpose, going at a heavy jog. The sound of their boots hitting pavement echoed through the streets, bouncing off of the mid-rise buildings of three to six stories tall that surrounded them. As they moved, ghouls pressed up against the windows of apartments and office buildings alike, smacking on the glass with excited hunger. A few blocks up, a pack of fifty or so came around the corner of the next block, making the turn straight towards the soldier's noise. Cap. Moss warned. Kersey nodded. I see them, he replied, and looked to the side, making sure they had plenty of space to get across the street. He contemplated for a moment before waving his hand. Just run past them, he instructed. We start fighting a mob that big and we're going to be here all day. The group picked up the pace, getting to the other side of the street and continuing their run. There were a handful of zombies that were on the next block in front of them, which the group dealt with by lowering their shoulders and knocking them to the ground. This continued for a few more blocks, with the occasional knife to the head of a zombie when the packs got a little too thick, all while creating a following of several hundred ghouls behind them. There's our building, Zeke said, pointing. Hang a left, and the door is all the way down on the next block. The group made it to Third Street, turning left to head down it. As they approached the intersection, they saw a few hundred zombies near the intersection on 4th, but they were focused on something else. When they started going down 3rd, the hundred-strong mob was half a block behind them, leaving them a little bit of time. However, there were thirty zombies between them and the door, as well as a couple dozen corpses strewn around the street. "'We weapons hardcap? Baker asked. Kersey shook his head. "'Silent,' he said. "'We have enough attention already without popping off. Baker let out a sigh while drawing his knife, along with the others. As they prepared for battle, Zeke's brow furrowed, and he clenched his jaw. Hey, Kersey said, noticing the man's look of concern. Talk. These weren't here a couple days ago, Zeke said. Kowalski shrugged. No shit, these things are mobile, you know, he quipped. I meant the dead ones, Zeke replied. Kersey let the implication sink in for a moment. Baker, Moss, get ready to go hot, he barked. Kowalski, let's clear a path to the door and get inside. Yes, sir, the sniper replied, and the two men stepped up shoulder to shoulder, with the others falling in behind them. Baker and Moss got their assault rifles ready, covering opposite sides of the street, scanning the windows for hostiles. The group moved fast, the leaders acting like blockers for the running back and knocking every ghoul in front of them to the ground. Where's the door? Kersey asked. Alleyway before the next road, Zeke replied, and the captain looked ahead, throwing a zombie out of the way so he could see. He spotted a narrow alley, barely enough for two people to get through shoulder to shoulder. He and Kowalski made it in, seeing a few zombies along the ten-yard corridor. They ran down, jamming their knives into the creatures' heads and tossing the bodies aside. Zeke was right behind them, the other two soldiers turning and aiming their guys down the alley waiting on the inevitable zombie mob. Kersey reached the door, but froze before opening it. Someone's been here, he said as he noticed that the latch that Zeke had installed was wide open. 
He grabbed the handle and pulled, but it was locked. Zeke, he called. He ran up, surveying the situation, and his eyes grew large. Can you get it open? Kersey asked. Zeke stared at it in stunned silence. Focus, the captain barked. Can you get it open? Zeke took a deep breath and nodded jerkily. Yeah, I just need a minute, he said. That's about all you're going to get, bud, Moss called, and Kersey turned to see ghouls pouring into the alleyway, blocking any chance they had at retreating. Pick your shots and light them up, the captain barked. Moss and Baker aimed carefully, squeezing the trigger and exploding the heads of the lead zombies. They immediately aimed at the creatures behind them, pulling the trigger again. They repeated this several more times in rapid succession, hoping to create a bit of a corpse barricade. Unfortunately, there were so many zombies behind them, all pushing forward. The corpses on the ground were pushed ahead. Their bodies scraped along the pavement, leaving a bloody stain. The closest standing ghoul was within six yards of them and closing. Moss and Baker continued firing while Zeke used a screwdriver on the door lock. He jammed the tip of it into the locking mechanism, jiggling it around and trying to find the correct position. There were several tense moments as Kersey and Kowalski looked back and forth between the coming mob. The zombies were within three yards, causing Baker and Moss to back up as far as they could. They'd dropped about twenty corpses, but it had done nothing to deter the ghouls. Kowalski, you want to use one of those pipe bombs? Moss cried. The sniper's eyes widened when he remembered he even had them, and pulled one out. Just as he was about to light it, Zeke whooped, and Kersey jerked the door open, shoving him inside. The other soldiers quickly followed, and Kersey slammed the door shut behind them just in time before the mob could get at them. He flicked the lock on the inside, securing the door. What the fuck was that? Baker cried. Thought you had that door ready to open. Before Zeke could respond, Kersey motioned for him to shut up. Secure this room now, he barked. The soldiers snapped into action, clearing the large maintenance room. It was dark inside, with only minimal light coming in from an open door leading into the mall. They swept the area, finding it clear. Kowalski went up to the small door, looking out into the mall area. There were dozens of stores, most of which had their gates closed. The second floor was open in the center, with a large walkway around the exterior. He scanned the area, looking for any signs of movement, but found none. He grabbed the door, which opened into the room, and closed it most of the way so he could still see. If there's someone else in here, they're being shy, he said. Kersey nodded. Keep watch while we figure out our next move, he instructed. On it, the sniper replied. How do we get up to the second floor? Kersey asked, turning around. There are two ways, Zeke replied. There is a double escalator in the center of the mall. The captain shook his head. Sounds a little too exposed for my taste, he said. There is a fire escape in the corner, back the way we came, Zeke said. Kersey nodded. Okay, that's the way up, he said. We have to assume there are hostiles in the building, so before we start figuring out how to get your people out, we have to clear this space. He paused, contemplating for a moment, and then glanced over at Zeke and pointed at the holster on his side. You know how to use that thing? he asked. I'm halfway decent at ten yards, Zeke admitted. Assuming the target isn't shooting back at me, that is. Kersey nodded thoughtfully. Better than nothing, I guess, he murmured, and walked over to the door that Kowalski stood sentinel at. He surveyed the open stores on both floors, seeing them spread out pretty well amongst the closed ones. The captain took a deep breath. Okay, here's how we're doing this, he finally said, turning back to the team. Baker, you're going to be with me on the ground level. Moss, Kowalski, and Zeke will cover the top floor. Kowalski, I want you to set up at the center overlooking things. You see someone pointing a gun in our direction. You take them out. They'll never see it coming, the sniper confirmed. Clear every open store and call it out on calm when you do, Kersey continued. Kowalski, you see anything suspicious, you call it out. There was a chorus in the affirmative, and he raised his hand, whirling it above his head. All right, he said. Let's get ready to rock. Chapter 5 The group stood by the maintenance room door, weapons at the ready. Kersey counted them down silently before busting out. 
The captain led Baker several steps from the room, aiming their weapons at the open storefronts and moving their focus from ground to second level and back again. Once they made sure nobody was there, Kersey hissed back, Kowalski, go! The sniper led his trio along the outer wall of the building, running hard towards the fire escape door. He kept his rifle raised, as did Moss. They reached it and paused briefly, resetting themselves before entering. They busted into the stairwell, quickly clearing it before moving up. They repeated the same pause at the second floor door before busting out. The trio stood at the entrance, sweeping the area and finding no movement. Wait until I'm in position, then get moving, Kowalski instructed quietly. Moss and Zeke nodded in agreement as the sniper ran along the outer wall. He looked at the stores against the wall, seeing all of them with their gates closed. They were mostly clothing and non-essential stores like makeup or furniture, so it was unlikely that anyone was hiding there. Kowalski reached the center, laying down on the ground and poking his rifle through the metal horizontal beams that made up the barrier. There was a ten-inch gap, which gave him plenty of room to move and aim while staying out of sight. The skylights in the ceiling bathed the mall with light, making it a nice, high-visibility sunny day inside. Kowalski raised his radio to his mouth. In position, he whispered. Captain, your team is good to move up. Copy that, Kersey replied, and he and Baker moved up the building, with the first open store about twenty yards up on their left. When they reached it, they turned their attention towards it, stopping at the corner and peering inside at an office supply store. The displays were still standing proud, as if the apocalypse hadn't touched it at all. Kersey motioned for Baker to go in while he covered him, and the private moved up, leading them both quickly through the aisles and to the back room. When they reached the storage area, Baker threw the door open and cleared it. First store, clear, Kersey said into his radio as they moved back to the mall proper. Copy that, Kowalski replied. Your next target is near the escalators in the center of the mall. Hold position. Moss, move up. He adjusted his aim to the right to cover Moss and Zeke as they moved up the right side. The first open store was about a quarter of the way up, and full of tents and camping gear. They followed the same example that Kersey had set out, pausing at the edge of the doorway and peeking in. Moss glanced back at Zeke. You go in first and I'll cover you, he said quietly. Sweep the area and get to the back of the store. Zeke nodded and moved inside, finding the store ransacked. Displays boasting winter clothing, jackets, tents, camping gear, all empty. We didn't do this, Zeke murmured. Moss nodded. Understood. They focused on the back storeroom door and then busted in, clearing it quickly. Moss raised his radio to his mouth. This position is clear, he said. Okay, Captain, Kowalski came back. Looks like you're up n- He swallowed the rest of his words when he spotted movement on the second floor. About two-thirds of the way down on the right, three heavily armed men emerged from a store, moving quietly with assault rifles raised. Kowalski, report, Kersey said. Got a trio of assholes trying to get the drop on Moss and Zeke, Kowalski replied tightly. Kersey and Baker moved to the edge of the store, peeking out to look for the movement up above. Can you take them out? the captain asked. I have a shot on the leader, Kowalski replied. But as soon as I shoot, they're going to take cover. We can give you a hand if you can pin them down, Moss came through. We should have a shot down here too, Kersey said. Sounds like a plan, Kowalski agreed, following the men with his scope. Wait on my signal. He tracked the leader, the gunmen totally oblivious to him. They moved up towards the camping store, reaching within twenty yards, about five yards between each of them. Here we go, Kowalski murmured, and then took aim, putting the leader's head squarely in his sights. The man moved slowly with his weapon raised, making him an easy target. The sniper squeezed the trigger, watching the man's head explode through the scope, dropping his corpse to the ground. The two others immediately dove for cover, one against the wall in a store and the other behind a metal trash can at the corner of a crosswalk between balconies. Kowalski tried to line up another shot but was unable to get a clean look. I don't have a shot, he said into the radio, and ducked down as much as he could as the gunman began to fire at him. 
They weren't very accurate, but the bullets were too close for comfort. Moss poked his head out of the camping store and took aim at the man in the crosswalk. He fired a three-round burst, peppering the man with bullets and riddling him with holes. The gunman by the store aimed towards the soldier, who ducked back out of sight. Kersey aimed carefully between the metal posts of the railing, but before he could pull the trigger, there was a crack of bullets, and Baker grabbed the back of his shirt, dragging him back into the office supply store. Kersey let out a deep whoosh of breath. Thanks, he said. Baker nodded and moved up to the storefront, peering down the mall on their side. Four gunmen moved up, taking up defensive positions by trash cans and other displays, with the closest being thirty yards away. Kowalski, we got four hostiles pinning us down, Baker said into his radio. Can you get a shot? The sniper flattened himself behind cover as the gunman on the second floor fired at him again. If this asshole will stop shooting at me, he hissed back. I'm on it, Moss said, and peeked out with his rifle to try to take a shot, immediately pushed back by gunfire. He clenched his jaw and then turned to Zeke. You trust me? he asked. His companion shrugged. I did before you asked me, he replied. Moss smirked. Usually the way that works, he quipped. Zeke sighed. What do you need me to do? Moss inclined his head. Run as hard as you can to the railing straight ahead, he said. And then? Zeke asked. Run straight back over here before someone from the first floor shoots at you, Moss replied. Zeke swallowed hard, the wheels turning in his head, but then nodded and got in a sprinting position five yards from the front of the store. Go! Moss cried. Zeke took off like a shot, running as hard as he could, and let out a scream as he reached the open mall. The enemy gunman was startled, turning his attention towards the crazed civilian. But before he could fire, Moss darted out and squeezed off a three-round burst, hitting the man in the chest and dropping him. Zeke didn't hesitate, touching the railing like it was a base in tag before tearing back to the store. He skidded inside like he was stealing home base, his chest heaving. You good? Moss asked as he helped him to his feet. Zeke nodded. I'm okay. Never doing that again, though, he said. Moss chuckled and patted him on the shoulder before talking into his radio. Kowalski, you're clear, he said. Got it, the sniper replied. You mind covering me? Moss asked Zeke, who nodded and followed him to the edge of the camping store. Make sure nobody else comes out of the woodwork on the second floor, he instructed. Zeke nodded again as Moss moved over to the railing to get a better view of the battle raging on the ground floor. Kersey and Baker were pinned down in the office supply store, with four men slowly advancing on their position. Kowalski, what do you need me to do? Moss asked. Just make sure if they shoot at someone up here, it's you, the sniper replied. Moss laughed a bit at the karma making him the bait. As soon as you fire, I fire, he promised. Kowalski didn't respond, instead taking up position at the corner of the second floor. This allowed him to see three of the four men continually popping up from behind cover to fire towards the store as they moved closer and closer. He found the lead one in his sights. Preparing to fire, he murmured, and then squeezed the trigger, hitting the man in the shoulder blade by his neck. As the body crumpled to the ground, one of the other gunmen yelled out, prompting the others to turn their attention up top. Moss immediately began to fire, sending three round bursts in their direction, and then dove back behind cover as the men on the floor shot back at him, hitting the railing and narrowly missing his head. Cap, I got their attention. Kowalski said, grabbing another gunman in his sights. He squeezed the trigger, this time hitting the man in the chest and sending him tumbling backwards. The remaining two spotted him this time, however, and turned their fire to the sniper. Kersey peeked out and motioned to Baker, and the two of them wasted no time breaking from the store and moving swiftly towards their targets. They took up firing positions and let loose with a torrent of bullets, shredding the enemy in seconds. Clear! Kersey said after scanning the area. Kowalski surveyed them all meticulously, and then reported, Clear! Moss, let's move through the rest of the building and clear it, the captain instructed. Kowalski, reposition. The soldiers did as ordered, quickly moving through the rest of the mall and finding it thankfully unoccupied. Clear on the first floor, Kersey said. Clear on the second, Moss came back, 
but I got something you might want to see. The captain led Baker up to the second floor and joined Moss and the others outside of a vacant store, with a makeshift campsite set up inside of it. Looks like these assholes have been here a while, Kowalski spat. Kersey looked back towards the windows overlooking the target building, spotting several holes punched through the safety glass. Clearly they'd been using those to take shots at the survivors across the way. The captain walked over and inspected them closely before looking through the window. He clenched his jaw and stood there in stunned silence. "'Hey, Cap?' Kowalski said slowly. "'You okay?' Kersey didn't respond, prompting everyone to walk over to the window. They all looked outside, joining him in quiet gaping at the flood of zombies outside. There were easily over five hundred corpses surrounding the building, pressing to get inside of the ground floor, which had several holes in the walls, in addition to open doors. Kersey finally sighed. This just got a hell of a lot more difficult, he said. Chapter 6 if anybody has ideas, I'm open to them, Kersey said. Moss raised a tentative hand. We can draw straws and send a runner to pull them away from the building, he suggested. Baker shook his head. That wouldn't pull them from the inside of the building, not to mention that with the noise you'd have to make, you would pull others in the city towards you. What if we just volunteer Kowalski? Moss joked. The sniper shook his head as a few of the guys chuckled. Kersey continued staring out towards the buildings on either side of the target, ignoring them and not even cracking a smile. The building to his right was across the street and five stories tall, while the one to the left was on the same block and three stories tall, like the target building. Zeke noticed him staring and sidled up next to him. What are you thinking, sir? he asked. Do you know the people in your group up there? Kersey asked. Zeke nodded. Yes, he replied. The athletic? the captain asked. Yes, sir. If Ahn doesn't send anybody out of the town who can't handle themselves, Zeke replied. Kersey inclined his head. Do you know a way into those buildings? he asked. Oh, that's no problem, Zeke said. The same developer built this entire block, and they wanted to give easy access to the mall from those office buildings. There are underground tunnels connecting the mall to them. Kowalski snorted. Man, that's a lot of work for something right across the street, he retorted. It's also a lot of work to get across the street when there's four feet of snow on the ground, Zeke countered. The sniper shrugged. Fair enough, he said. I like where your head's at, Cap, Moss piped up as he stepped towards the window. But how are we getting those people out from the adjacent buildings? That one on the left is close enough, Baker said, pointing. We can rig something up. It's still a ten-foot gap, Moss argued. Athletic or not, I don't see anybody willing to make that jump. Zeke's eyes widened. I have an idea, he exclaimed, and ran off back towards the camping store. The rest of the soldiers exchanged shrugs and glances, and then followed him, pausing at the entrance to the store as he rummaged around. This place was pretty well ransacked, Moss said, hooking a hand into his belt. What are you hoping to find? Zeke shook his head as he walked down an aisle that was mostly intact. It was looted for things they thought would be useful, he called over his shoulder. Tents, jackets, stuff like that. He scanned the shelves, finally grabbing a pack of something and returning to the others. I didn't think this would be high up on their list, he said, and tossed it to Kersey. The captain caught the package, a hundred feet of climber's rope. I think he might be onto something, he said with a grin and tossed it over to Moss. This stuff going to be strong enough? Moss asked, turning the package over in his hands. Each rope is rated to 175 pounds, Zeke replied with a shrug. We have 20 packs of rope back there, so if they're heavier than that, they're out of luck. Baker nodded thoughtfully. Now we just need a way to get it across, he mused. Oh! Kowalski cried. I got that! He whirled around to face a dumbbell display by the front window, and then headed back, doing reps with a five-pound weight proudly. A five-pounder? Moss teased. Really? Kowalski shrugged. A man's gotta know his limits, he joked. Okay, we got a plan to get them out, 
Kersey said with a firm nod. Moss, Baker, Zeke, I want you three to handle getting them out of the building. Moss shook his head, blinking rapidly. What are you and Kowalski going to do? he asked. Yeah, Kowalski echoed. What are you and Kowalski going to do? We have to assume this wasn't all of the Chosen that are in the area, Kersey replied. We're going to clear out that building on the right, and Kowalski here is going to put a bullet into the face of anybody who tries to take a pot shot at you while those people are going across. Kowalski raised a victory fist. All right, he declared. That's an idea I can get behind. Good to hear, Kersey replied. Now let's move out. Chapter 7 Kowalski and Kersey moved through the underground tunnel, leaving the mall door open so there was a little bit of extra light. Both men pulled out small flashlights to help. There were no signs of a struggle or anything down there, like nobody had been there since the zombies appeared. It was also about ten degrees colder than outside, which made Kowalski shiver a bit. Never thought I'd miss the desert, he muttered. Oh, come on, Kersey teased. You mean you don't like being in Idaho in winter? Wouldn't have been my first choice, Cap, Kowalski replied dryly. They made their way through the tunnel, reaching the other side without incident, and walking up a set of stairs to stop at the door. Kersey listened for a moment, and then turned off his light, cracking it open as quietly as possible. He peered through the crack into the lobby, seeing that it was completely still, with only the faint sound of moans coming from the outside. What do you see? Kowalski whispered. Looks like we're alone, Kersey murmured back. Alone as in no gunman? the sniper asked. Or alone alone, like nothing trying to eat us either? Alone alone? Kersey confirmed. Kowalski nodded. That's a plus, he quipped. The captain motioned for the sniper to follow him, and the two of them reached the lobby. They moved quickly, running over to the front reception desk and taking cover to safely survey the situation. The bottom floor wall was mostly windows, but only a handful of zombies were pressed up against it. Most of the ghouls were focused on the neighboring building. Let's find a stairwell and get out of sight before too many of those things know we're here, the captain suggested. They looked around for a sign over the door, and finally Kowalski pointed to the back corner. Found it, he said, and they readied their guns before sprinting silently to the stairwell door. Kersey did a silent countdown before breaching the stairwell, and they cleared it quickly, finding it empty. They moved up the stairs, concerned only with reaching the top as silently as possible. Finally, they reached the top floor, and Kersey carefully unlatched the door, holding his breath at the sound of voices. They were far enough away that he chanced sneaking inside, motioning for Kowalski to stay low and silent. They carefully closed the door behind them, and took cover behind the row of cubicles that stretched across the entire floor, staying low as they listened carefully. Kersey heard two on his side and held up two fingers to Kowalski, who responded with three fingers for his side. The captain drew his knife, and his companion did the same, even though he wrinkled his nose, looking unhappy about it. The soldiers split up, heading towards the outer walls, listening for footsteps while the gunmen chattered amongst themselves, occasionally firing off a shot. Kersey poked his head up over a cubicle wall, seeing that there were two men sitting in front of a blown-out floor-to-ceiling window with hunting rifles pointing at the neighboring building. Another man stood behind them, slapping them on the back and laughing. Another man headed in his direction, and Kersey ducked back down and curled into a cubicle. He waited for the man to walk about and towards his hiding spot. He waited for the exact right moment, and then lashed out, grabbing the man by the mouth and jerking him down to the ground, stabbing him in the jugular. Kersey waited, with his hand on his gun, just in case the noise had attracted any unwanted attention. But the three by the window continued their raucous chatter and laughter. He dragged the body all the way into the cubicle, and then scanned the room, spotting Kowalski giving him hand signals. It took a moment for the captain to figure out what Kowalski was suggesting, but when it finally dawned on him, 
he grinned widely and nodded. The two soldiers broke position, moving up to the center aisle that led directly to the gunman's position. They quietly motioned specifics at each other, and then turned their attention towards the enemy. One of the gunmen fired through the window. Damn, he said with a sigh. I swear I almost got one that time. I don't know, man, the spectator behind them said. Looks like you hid his shadow, though. That's got to be worth half a point, right? The gunman asked, hopefully. Bullshit, the one beside him barked. You ain't getting points for missing. Still got closer than you, the first one shot back. Oh, yeah? His friend demanded. Watch this. All three men focused on the building across the street. All of the windows had been blown out of the regular brick facade, the areas around the frames pockmarked from bullets. From their vantage point of two stories higher, they could see into the main floor of the building. Kowalski and Kersey slowly moved up, reaching within five yards without detection. They waited patiently for the gunman to squeeze the trigger, firing off a shot, and as soon as the boom echoed throughout the room, they sprung. Both soldiers threw themselves into the spectator in the back, smacking into him with extreme force. The guy never saw them coming, and he flailed, his weight slamming into the gunman and forcing them both forward, sending the screaming trio out the blasted window and over the edge. The soldiers watched as the three men sailed helplessly down to the pavement below, where blood splattered spectacularly after a sickening thud echoed back up to them. Don't think they're getting up from that, Kowalski said. A couple dozen zombies broke away from the main pack, staggering over to feast on the fallen men. Even if their brains survived, I don't think they'll be in any condition to run, Kersey mused. Kowalski shrugged. Let's hope at any rate, he said. What do you say? Kersey asked. Want to see if anybody is home? The sniper nodded and put two fingers in his mouth, letting out a deafening whistle. Hey! he cried. You in the building over there! Anybody home? There was no answer, and after a moment he let out another whistle. I said, is anybody home? Kowalski bellowed. Ivan sent us to get you out. There was movement in one of the windows, and a young man crawled into sight along the ground. He took up a seated position beside the wall, his face out of sight. Who are you? he called. We're friends of Ivan, and here to get you out, Kersey yelled back. Unless you have a pair of bulletproof wings, I don't see that happening, the young man yelled. Kowalski leaned on the window frame. We took care of the shooters, he bellowed. Those aren't the only people shooting at us, the young man called back. And, as if on cue, more gunshots went off, hitting the window frame where he was. Listen to me, Kersey yelled. Get to the other side of the building. We have people coming to get you. Go, now! The young man crawled away, and Kersey readied his assault rifle, picking up a fallen chair from their assault. Cover them, in case there are more shooters across the street, the captain instructed. Kowalski raised an eyebrow. Where are you going? he asked. I'm going to go clear out that other group, Kersey said. The sniper nodded and got into firing position, training his aim on the building beside the mall. Kersey headed purposefully towards the stairwell, preparing for another battle. Chapter 8 Moss, Baker, and Zeke breached the door into the building, guns aimed expecting zombie resistance since the doors were open. Much to their relief, they found themselves in a stairwell that was sealed off from the main lobby. Better lucky than good, Zeke quipped. Come on, let's get into position, Moss said and they worked their way up to the third floor, stopping outside of the door in the stairwell. You stay behind me while we clear this place out, Baker said, and Zeke nodded, waiting for the others to get ready. Baker gave a silent countdown, and they breached the door. The floor was mostly cleared out, with some desks up against the wall. There were two broken-out floor-to-ceiling windows facing the target building, and this put them on edge but they quickly figured out they were alone. If anybody was here, they're gone now, Moss said. Baker nodded. Let's get to the window, he said. The trio rushed over and looked down at the windows on the target building that had been shot out. 
They were standard size over there, nestled in brick. The soldiers looked over the edge carefully, making sure nobody was waiting on them for an ambush. Well, see if your people are there, Moss finally said, waving Zeke forward. He moved to the edge, cupping his hands around his mouth. Hey, guys, it's Zeke, he called. Anybody there? A few moments passed, and a young man crawled up towards a busted-out window about ten feet away. He cautiously looked over the windowsill at them, his eyes brightening. Man, am I glad to see you, he said. You got anybody else in there with you? Baker asked. The younger man nodded. Three others, he said. Three? Zeke asked, brow furrowing. I thought you went out with six. He nodded solemnly. We did, he said. The group paused for a moment to let both him and Zeke deal with that information before getting back to the task at hand. Get the others, because we have to move, Moss instructed. The young man nodded, and Zeke knelt down, tying several pieces of climber's rope to the dumbbell. Think four ought to do it? he asked. Moss nodded. Should be plenty, he agreed, and looked around, spotting a metal desk about ten yards away. Tied off to that, he said. Should be heavy enough. Baker grabbed the other ends of the rope and ran off to secure it. As he did, the young man returned with three others in tow. How are we getting across? he asked. Zeke held up the dumbbell. I'm going to throw some rope over to you, he explained. You just need to secure it and climb over. The young man nodded and motioned for Zeke to throw it. He wound up, but Moss held up a hand to stop him. He pulled out about twenty feet of rope and then held tight to it. Just in case you miss, he said. Zeke nodded and turned, winding up and throwing a strike across the alley, the dumbbell landing right in the middle of the window. He turned and gave the soldier a bit of a smirk, prompting him to drop the rope. Nice throw, kid, Moss said, appraising his work. Secure that line and start climbing, Zeke called. We're on the clock. The young man nodded and went to do the job. A few moments later, the rope went taut across the alley, and people approached the window. The first person to climb over the sill was a young woman that looked to be in her late twenties. She hopped up and expertly climbed across, moving quickly. Baker held out his hand and pulled her inside, readying himself for the next. The next man looked a little older, and hesitated at the window as he stared fearfully at the rope. Come on, man, we're not safe here, Moss urged. The man hesitated for another moment before nodding, taking a deep breath and climbing up. He inched halfway across when a shot rang out. The bullet missed, hitting the side of the building, and the other civilians backed away from the window. Keep climbing, Moss cried. The man gripped the rope for dear life, not moving. Come on, Baker urged. I've got you. He held his hand out, and the man clenched his jaw, slowly moving forward. Moss stuck his head out the window, gun aimed at the building across the street, but he couldn't get a clean shot. Damn it, he muttered, and raised his radio to his lips. Kowalski, are you in position? Sit tight, the sniper came back. We're being fired on, Moss barked. And I'm working on it, Kowalski shot back. Moss watched helplessly as another barrage of bullets came towards the climber. One hit him in the arm and he lost his grip, hanging only by his legs. Screams echoed from the other side as the civilians watched on, horrified. Just reach out, Baker said, leaning as far as he could out the window. I got you, buddy. The man reached for him, hissing as blood poured from his arm, but another shot punched into his side and he went limp, plummeting down into the zombie horde. Damn it! They got one! Moss cried into his walkie-talkie. Kowalski! Do you have a shot? A rifle blast went off from above, and Moss looked up at the fifth floor of the building. He watched the sniper fire again, but then shook his head in frustration. Got one of them! Kowalski's voice came through the radio. But there's another one I don't have an angle on. If he pokes his head out, I'll take it off, but I don't think he's going to be that stupid. Moss sighed. Got it, he said. I'm going to give you a signal when we have the next person ready to go. Maybe you can pin him down and buy our people a few seconds. 
Worth a shot, Kowalski agreed. Stand by, Moss said, and turned to Baker, who ran over to the window facing the building the shooter was in. You have a shot? he asked. Baker shook his head. He knows where we are, and he's too far back, he said. What about the second floor? Moss asked. Baker shrugged. Good work, he said. Stay over here at the window. I got the fucker, Moss said, and Baker waved him over, pointing out where the gunman was hiding. There were several zombies right outside the window, but several planks of wood kept them at bay. You see that broken window on the right? Baker asked. He's in there, hiding behind the wooden barricade. Moss nodded and turned to Zeke, who stood with the shaken woman they'd rescued. You make sure those people are ready to move, Moss said firmly. Zeke nodded. They will be, he promised. Moss ran down the stairs, hitting the second floor landing and cracking open the door. There were about a dozen zombies spread out in there, and he internally sighed. Shit, he thought bitterly, and kept looking, spotting the path to the window he needed. There were several desks lined up, like an open office space minus the cubicles. There was only one zombie within ten yards of his target, and he took a deep breath. Moss flicked his rifle into three-round burst mode and readied himself, sneaking into the room and gently shutting the door behind him. He gave it a soft tug to make sure it was latched, and then did a silent countdown before taking off running as hard as he could. His footsteps drew the attention of every zombie in the room, and they immediately began pursuit. Halfway across the room, he lowered his shoulder at the lone ghoul in his path, smashing it in the chest and sending it to the ground. This bought him a scant few seconds, and he raised his weapon aiming quickly at the gunman across the way, and launching a barrage of three round bursts. The window shattered, and the gunman flew back from his spot, blood splattering everywhere. Baker, get him going, Moss said into his radio, and then dropped his hand, turning around at the dozen zombies within five yards of him. There wasn't a clear pathway back to the door, but he spotted a series of desks to his right and he lunged over, clambering up on top. He leapt from desk to desk, avoiding the rotted hands trying to grab his feet as he moved, managing to make it across without getting tripped up. He dove to the floor on the other side, sinking into a perfect roll and popping back up in front of the door, throwing it open and slamming it shut behind him. He allowed himself a second to breathe, and then took off up the stairs, walking onto the third floor. Is this everybody? he asked as he approached the window where the young man and another survivor were standing with the woman who'd made it across first. We got him, Baker confirmed. Moss lifted his radio to his mouth. Captain, you copy? he asked. There was no response, and he clenched his jaw. Captain, do you copy? he asked again, more forcefully. The captain is dealing with some assholes at the moment, Kowalski replied dryly. We got our people and are headed back to the vehicle, Moss said. I suggest you two do the same. On the move, the sniper agreed. Moss put his radio away and then checked his rifle ammo, turning to the others. Come on, let's get back to the truck, he said, and led them free of the building, hoping that Captain Kersey could do the same. Chapter 9 Kowalski grabbed his rifle after Moss's confirmation they were clear and on the move but gunshots coming from the building he was in gave him pause. You'd better be okay, Cap, he muttered to himself. I'm in no mood to kill every last one of these assholes to avenge your death. He moved towards the door, stopping about fifteen yards short when he heard noise coming from inside the stairwell. He ducked down inside a cubicle, hiding in the shadows and aiming his rifle towards the door. When the door opened, two men entered, guns raised. They reached the top of the aisle looking around, and Kowalski took aim, firing through the first man's chest and into the second man's shoulder, spinning him to the ground. The first one dropped dead, but the second one had some life left in him and squeezed the trigger of his rifle in Kowalski's general direction. The sniper leapt over the cubicle wall to avoid getting shot, as the wounded man flailed around trying to aim. Kowalski landed hard on the ground as another bullet flew in his direction so he dove to the ground. He scampered up the back aisle, aiming towards the wounded enemy and quickly pulling the trigger. The bullet ripped through the man's gut, 
causing him to drop his weapon as he screamed in agony. Kowalski stayed on the ground, aiming in the man's direction until he was sure that there were no more bullets coming his way. Once sure, he got up and walked over, keeping his rifle carefully aimed. The sniper stood over the fallen enemy, an older gentleman in his fifties. Kowalski kicked him in the side, prompting some groans. Yeah, that's what you get for being an asshole, the sniper said bitterly. The man grunted as he curled around his wounds. I didn't do anything to you, boy, he huffed. Gunshots echoed from lower floors, and Kowalski shook his head. Sounds like your friends are trying to do something to my captain there, he said. And I know for a fact you've been doing stuff to my friends in the building across the street. The dying man chuckled through a mouthful of blood. Those heathens, he babbled. Why the hell would you care about riffraff like that? Kowalski pressed the barrel of his gun against the man's heart, cutting his laughter off immediately. Yeah, not so funny when someone with a gun doesn't think your life is worth anything, is it? He asked, eyes blazing. The man shook his head jerkily. How many men are downstairs? Kowalski demanded. More than you and your precious captain can handle, the dying man replied. The sniper rolled his eyes. Yeah, well, I'm sure your friends on this floor thought the same thing, he drawled. Now three of them are roadkill. You know what? I was going to let you bleed out, but maybe you'd like to die down there with your friends. The man's eyes grew wide, but he didn't say anything. Kowalski shrugged and leaned down, grabbing his leg and dragging him towards the window. Okay, okay, the man shrieked. There are ten of them down there. Kowalski dropped his leg and sighed. Shit, he muttered. He headed for the door, but just as he reached it, he could hear the man fumbling around for something. He turned back just in time to see the guy hissing as he reached for his ankle. Kowalski drew his sidearm and fired around into the man's head. Just had to reach for an ankle gun, didn't you? He muttered, and slung his sniper rifle securely over his shoulder. He raised his handgun and moved to the stairwell door, pausing and cracking it open to see if anybody else was waiting for him. Nobody appeared to be in the stairwell, but the gunfire below continued to intensify. He raised his radio to his lips and said quietly, I don't know if you can hear me, Cap, but I'm coming in hot. The sniper worked his way down the stairwell, stopping at the fourth floor and listening hard, hearing nothing. The gunfire continued below, and he darted down to the third floor. He cracked open the door, looking inside. It had once been a large cubicle farm, but now it was a war zone. Two men were right in front of the door, firing towards the back right corner. Kowalski looked past them at several more men on the left, working their way across to the right. He composed himself before throwing open the door and darting in, shooting the man on his right in the back of the head as soon as he moved. As the man next to him whipped around with a shotgun, Kowalski dove to the left to avoid the shot, lashing up with his handgun and putting several bullets in the guy's gut, dropping him quickly. Kowalski grabbed the shotgun, checking the ammo. At least got one shot left, he muttered, and knelt down, picking up a couple of rounds off of the dead man, who had them in a bandolier slung over his shoulder. He slammed them in while surveying the room. There were at least half a dozen men to his left, scattered about and poking their heads up from behind cover to fire towards the right. On the right, Kersey popped up briefly to return fire, only to be driven back down. Thankfully, nobody noticed two missing, since it was so loud in there already. The closest man to Kowalski was about five yards away and solely focused on the captain. He ran up and shot him in the side of the head with the shotgun at almost point-blank range. As the enemy's head exploded and his body dropped, Kowalski racked in another shell, but dropped down to the floor as two others about ten yards away shifted their focus to him. Cap! Get out of here! Kowalski screamed. Kersey popped his head up from behind cover as the men began to fire at the sniper, who was right across from the door. He slammed a new magazine into his assault rifle, jumping up and opening fire on his new opponents. His bullets didn't find their target but it did a good job of forcing them behind cover, giving him a chance to move towards the door. Others in the room opened fire at him, forcing the captain to stay low as he ran for the door. As he did, 
One of the men yelled into a radio, telling someone about their position on the third floor. Kowalski, we gotta move, Kersey said as he skidded next to the sniper. Kowalski popped up and unloaded the remaining three shells into the cubicle walls, managing to strike one man and forcing the others to hit the ground hard. He dropped the shotgun and pulled out his handgun again, joining the captain at the door. The two soldiers rushed out, slamming the door shut behind them and diving for the concrete walls as bullets ripped through the door. Did they get the survivors out? Kersey huffed as they thundered down the stairs. Kowalski nodded. They're on their way back to the truck, he replied. Let's not keep them waiting, Kersey said. But they were forced to stop before they hit the second floor landing as the first floor door slammed open, allowing several men to rush inside. Kowalski leaned over the railing and fired a few shots with his handgun to keep them at bay for the moment. Second floor it is then, Kersey said, and hit the landing just as a gunman started up the stairs leading to it. Kowalski threw open the door and dove inside as the captain fired a three-round burst, hitting the man in the shoulder and causing him to miss the shot. As the sniper ran into the second floor office, a beast of a man tackled him to the floor. Kersey whipped around and raised his weapon, but someone near the back of the large open room squeezed off a few rounds in his direction. The captain returned fire, looking out from behind a desk at four other men in the room, spread out across the cubicle-free maze of desks. He glanced over at Kowalski, who was being picked up by a hulking man and thrown like a rag doll over a desk. He took aim at the large man, but then was forced to switch tactics and fire towards the gunman aiming at him. He sent out a three-round burst while diving for a metal desk. When he popped up again, he didn't have a shot on the large man who had Kowalski by the neck and held him up as a human shield. Footsteps thundered in the stairwell, and the door behind Kersey jerked open, but he fired two bursts in that direction, ripping right through the door. He wasn't sure if he hit anyone but the door didn't budge after that. Before he could turn and fire towards the others, someone screamed in panic, No, no, no! A split second later, a gigantic explosion ripped through the center of the room. Kowalski! Kersey screamed. He gaped at the giant hole in the floor where they'd been, a few desks falling through it to the first floor, and no sign of the sniper. The captain put his shock aside, swallowing hard and pressing himself against the ground as the gunfire started up again. He focused on a pair of feet through the bottom opening of the desk and squeezed off a burst, hitting the ankles and dropping the enemy to the ground. Before he could land a kill shot, the door behind him opened up again and bullets flew, hitting the drawers on the desk. Kersey turned and fired blindly, forcing the gunman's next shot to miss as he reacted. The captain found his aim and fired, pumping three rounds into his opponent's chest. As he dropped, another man popped up behind him, and Kersey pulled the trigger. But his gun clicked empty. Damn it, he muttered, and then leapt to his feet, sprinting across towards the front of the building. He slung his rifle over his shoulder and pulled out his handgun, blindly firing backwards and buying himself a brief moment to get to the window. Bullets whizzed by him but he stayed as low as he could, managing to avoid getting hit. Five yards from the window, another gunman stepped in front of him, and Kersey opened fire, pulling the trigger as fast as he could while sprinting. The bullets hit the man in the chest, others missing him entirely and punching through the large window behind him. The captain lowered his shoulder, catching the man's shirt and shoving him back into the glass. The window shattered, and Kersey moved his arms to the man's shoulders, riding him down to the ground until they landed with a dull thud. The impact still knocked the wind out of Kersey, and he struggled to get moving. Moans echoed nearby, and that motivated Kersey to struggle harder, looking up at half a dozen zombies within a few yards of him. He staggered to his feet, shoving away a set of rotting arms that reached for him. The captain managed to stumble out of the circle of zombies, putting a little bit of distance between him and the man on the ground who was still groaning and moving a bit. This attracted the attention of the ghouls, and they leaned down to feast on the easy prey. As Kersey shuffled away, still in pain from the fall, he looked back up towards the broken window, raising his gun towards it. 
A moment later, one of the Chosen appeared there, looking out at his fallen comrade. Kersey fired a few times, hitting the man in the shoulder and driving him back long enough to get across the street and behind cover. He glanced at the hundred-strong pack of zombies in pursuit of him, but couldn't see inside the first floor. I hope you're still kicking Kowalski, he thought desperately, and kept pushing, moving as fast as he could back towards the truck. Chapter 10 Moss and the others waited by the truck, occasionally calling out on the radio. Captain, Kowalski! Come in, Baker said, and then tossed his walkie-talkie onto the hood of the truck in frustration. Moss smacked down a few wayward zombies from across the street and then sauntered back over. Still no answer? he asked, voice hoarse. Nothing, Baker replied bitterly. Moss checked his watch and shook his head. Been fifteen minutes since we've heard any gunfire, he said. Both soldiers let out a defeated sigh knowing that this wasn't a good sign. If the gunfire had stopped, then that meant the battle was over, one way or the other. How much more time you want to give them? Baker asked helplessly. Moss checked his watch again. Five minutes, he finally said. Zeke got out of the truck, brow furrowed. You're going to leave them behind? he asked. Hey, it's not our first choice, Baker replied but we're sitting here completely exposed with a bunch of civilians. Moss nodded. I've already had my fill of firefights today, he admitted. If we get into another in our current position, we're probably not getting out of it. Zeke paused for a moment and then finally nodded, shoulders slumping. A moment later, a gunshot cracked from a block up, prompting both soldiers to take battle positions. They watched intently, waiting for someone to appear be it foe or hopefully friend. Much to their relief, Kersey emerged from the side of the building, moving with the gait of an old man. Just behind him were dozens of zombies, all within ten yards. Zeke! Moss barked, and the trio ran a block up to get to the captain. Zeke and Baker took Kersey by the arms, helping him to move quickly towards the truck, while Moss laid down some cover fire, hitting several zombies in the head to cause a bit of a pile-up. When they reached the truck, there was about three-quarters of a block separating them from the zombies. "'Where's Kowalski?' Moss demanded. Kersey shook his head. "'I don't know,' he replied. "'You don't know?' Moss snapped. The captain shrugged helplessly. "'We got into a hell of a fight with the Chosen. There was an explosion near him and the floor collapsed,' he explained. "'One second he was there, and the next second he was gone. I lost my radio in the battle, so I wasn't able to call out.' We've been trying to raise you guys for twenty minutes, and nothing, Baker said. Moss clenched his jaw. Let's go get him then, he demanded. Kersey shook his head. We're not getting back into the building right now, he said. Those things are swarming, he pointed to the zombies that had made it half a block away. If he's still alive, Kowalski is on his own for now. The others all looked dejected, but nobody argued. Eventually they piled into the vehicle which was a tight fit with the trio of survivors they'd rescued. Moss got behind the wheel, starting up the engine and peeling out, leaving the zombie mob in his wake. He stared into the rearview mirror, hoping that Kowalski was out there and still putting up a fight. The End Up next, The Battle for Idaho Continues <laughs>